This is the extended guide to the cruiser Admiral Graf Spee of the Kriegsmarine. The Admiral Graf Spee was the last Deutschland-class Panzerschiff built. Named after Admiral Maximilian von Spee, the commander of the East Asia Squadron in World War I, that had fought the battles of Coronel and the Falkland Islands, where he was killed in action. The ship was laid down in October 1932 and completed by January 1936. Although nominally under the 10,000 long tons limitation imposed by the Treaty of Versailles, the full load displacement turned out to be over 16,000 long tons, so just a little bit of budging had gone into the paperwork there. By the time she was completed, the overall top speed achievable had increased to 28 knots, which meant that only the British battlecruisers could outrun and outgun her, although the Dunkirk class was almost immediately started by the French to be capable of the same kind of performance. As with the other ships of her class, the primary armament was six 11-inch guns in two triple turrets, with a secondary battery of eight 5.9-inch guns in single turrets grouped to midships. But by the time World War II broke out, her specific anti-aircraft battery had been upgraded, the 88mm guns originally installed being replaced by six 105mm guns, four 37mm guns, and ten 20mm guns. The ship still carried its pair of quadruple torpedo launchers on the stern, but had also received the SeaTact radar set, the first German warship to be equipped with radar equipment. The ship was originally ordered to replace the pre-dreadnought battleship Braunschweig, and commissioned into the German Navy as the flagship. In summer of 1936, she headed to the Atlantic to participate in three non-intervention patrols off the Republican-held coast of Spain, and once this was done, she stopped by Great Britain in 1937 to represent Germany at the Coronation Review for King George V. The Sixth. After that, it was back to Spain for a fourth patrol, then, following some quick fleet manoeuvres and a visit to Sweden, a fifth and final patrol in February 1938. This was then succeeded by goodwill visits to various foreign ports, more fleet manoeuvres, and a German fleet review. But with the clouds of war looming in 1939, the ship departed on a cruise to the South Atlantic. In hindsight, the comparisons between the ship and its namesake were somewhat eerie, the Graf Spee leaving Germany before the outbreak of the war, and in the event, would never return home. Following the official outbreak of World War II, the ship was ordered to start commerce raiding, but was instructed to strictly adhere to prize rules, which required raiders to stop and search ships for contraband before sinking them, and to ensure that their crews were safely evacuated. The ship also had additional orders to avoid combat, even with inferior opponents, and to frequently change position. This was because Germany lacked a large surface navy, and it was held that it was better to sink more merchant ships and stay intact, than hamper these activities with actual combat, which might cause damage even if the fight was won, which would impair its main mission, which was to sink merchant ships. Graf Spee's wartime campaign started off fairly well, evading the British heavy cruiser HMS Cumberland, and finding and sinking the cargo ship Clement off the coast of Brazil. Whilst the captain and chief engineer were taken prisoner, the rest of the crew were allowed to abandon ship and left in their lifeboats. Captain Langsdorff sent a distress call so that they could be picked up, but in the event they were not actually found by another ship, but happily the British crew of the lifeboats later reached the Brazilian coast simply by sailing there in said lifeboats. By the start of October, the British and French navies had formed a total of eight groups to try and hunt the ship down. The carriers Hermes, Eagle, Ark Royal and Bairn were in participation, along with the battlecruiser Renown and the French battleships Dunkirk and Strasbourg, plus 16 assorted heavy and light cruisers. Of these, Force G, commanded by Commodore Henry Harwood, was assigned to the east coast of South America, comprising the heavy cruisers Cumberland and Exeter, and the light cruisers Ajax and Achilles. The Cumberland was sent to patrol off the Falkland Islands, while the other three cruisers patrolled off the River Plate. Happily ignorant of these events, the Graf Spee continued her campaign, capturing the steamer Newton Beach for use as a prisoner transport, and sinking the steamer Ashleya. She would then sink the Newton Beach because the ship turned out to be too slow to keep up and the prisoners were transferred to the Graf Spee herself. A bit later she captured the steamer Huntsman, but since she was now full of prisoners they sent the ship off to rendezvous with the Altmark. The Graf Spee would then rendezvous later that week with the supply ship Altmark and the Huntsman. All prisoners were transferred to the Altmark and then the Huntsman was sunk as well. 
The first part of her South Atlantic campaign was rounded out by sinking the steamer Trevanian, but since the Allied shipping activity was getting quite intense in the South Atlantic, Captain Langsdorf sailed to the Indian Ocean. Now, by this point, the Graf Spee had sailed for over 30,000 nautical miles and was in bad need of an engine overhaul, which was limiting her top speed. Nevertheless, she would then go on to sink the tanker Africa Shell, and stopped an unidentified Dutch steamer, but decided not to sink her. Having decided the South Atlantic had calmed down enough, the Graf Spee was back, in mid-November, to refuel from the Altmark. Whilst they were replenishing their supplies, the crew built a second dummy gun turret on the forward part of the ship, and put a second dummy funnel behind the aircraft catapult to alter her silhouette, to make her look at long distance as if she was an allied ship. Using the ship's Arado float plane, they located the merchant ship Doric Star, followed by the steamer Tyroa, and finally the Strion Shala. All of these ships were sunk, but the Doric Star managed to get out a distress call that prompted Force G to move its squadron cruisers to the mouth of the River Plate. Unfortunately, after Stirling service in September, the Arado floatplane broke down and couldn't be repaired. Now knowing that enemy ships could be seen only shortly before they entered firing range, the ship's disguise was removed so as not to hinder the ship in battle. The next morning at 5.30, Lookout spotted masts off the starboard bow. Initially, this was thought to be the escort for a convoy that had been mentioned in documents recovered from the Thai rower. However, shortly thereafter, it was identified to be the HMS Exeter, accompanied by a pair of smaller warships which were initially identified as destroyers. Despite those initial orders to avoid combat, Captain Langsdorf decided he wasn't going to flee, and so ordered his ships to battle stations and to close at maximum speed. He realised a little bit too late that he was actually facing three cruisers, but decided to keep closing anyway. Now this strategy might seem odd when you think, oh well he's got 11 inch guns, surely he could destroy them out of the effective range of 6 and 8 inch guns. But the fact was, with the Graf Spee's engines desperately in need of an overhaul, he knew the British cruisers had a 4 to 6 knot speed advantage, and they could in principle stay out of range if they chose to do so whilst calling for reinforcements. By closing the range early in the battle, he would at least have a prolonged period in which he could try and sink them, and his ship was ultimately more heavily armed and more heavily armoured than any of his opponents. Commodore Harwood had planned for this kind of eventuality, and the ships executed their battle plan. The Exeter turned to the northwest, while the Ajax and Achilles turned to the northeast, attempting to bracket the Graf Spee and force it to spread its fire. The Graf Spee opened fire with the 11 inch guns at Exeter and with the secondary battery at Ajax and Achilles. Given the rapidly shortening range, it wasn't long before the British and New Zealand cruisers returned the favour. From the outset, the Graf Spee's gunfire proved to be fairly accurate, straddling the Exeter with her third salvo. The first near miss by an 11 inch shell, just short of the Exeter, managed to kill the ship's torpedo tube crews with splinters, damaged communications, and searchlights, and wrecked the poor old walrus floatplane just as it was about to take off to do gunnery spotting. A few minutes later, another 11 inch shell scored a direct hit on B turret, putting it out of action. The shrapnel from this hit killed or wounded all the bridge personnel except for the captain and two other officers, and the ship's internal communications were completely wrecked. From now on, steering the ship had to be done by a chain of messengers to the manual steering position at the back of the ship, which hampered the Exeter's manoeuvrability. Ajax and Achilles, meanwhile, had closed the range down to 13,000 yards and started making as if to cross the Graf Spee's T, which forced her to split her main armament with the forward turret firing at the light cruisers, and as well as the 5.9-inch secondary battery. Shortly thereafter, Exeter would fire two torpedoes from her remaining starboard torpedo tubes, but both of these would miss. The Ajax would launch her spotter float plane, and the Exeter would turn to try and get her port torpedoes in action, but receive two more 11 inch shell hits for her trouble. One hit the, hitting the forward A turret and putting it out of action, the other one hitting the hull and starting fires. At this point, Exeter only had her rear turret in action, and that was only under local control as all communications to the fire direction posts had been severed. This led to the rather amusing sight of the turret commander standing on the roof of the turret and yelling instructions through a hatch to those inside. The Exeter was now listing at 7 degrees, 
with flooding from multiple holes and being steered only using a small compass rescued from one of the ship's boats. However, at this point, a critical blow was scored. Using her two remaining guns, Exeter managed to score a single 8-inch shell hit that penetrated through two decks before exploding near the graph space funnel. Critically, this destroyed her fuel processing system and left her with just 16 hours of fuel remaining. This was not enough to let her go home. At this point, the Graf Bay had been fighting for about an hour, and although the ship's armour had held up and the ship was in no danger of sinking, the fuel repair system couldn't be repaired whilst under fire, as it was very complex. Two-thirds of the anti-aircraft guns and one of the secondary turrets had also been knocked out, and there were no friendly naval bases in reach, and of course no reinforcements. So Captain Langsdorff decided to head for the neutral port of Montevideo to try and sort out the damage that his ship had incurred, and hopefully then make it home. However, to get to port, the ship had to go past the Exeter, which was listing heavily to starboard and taking on water, but still happily firing away with its one remaining turret, as well as the Ajax and Achilles peppering the ship with rather ineffectual six-inch fire. Therefore, the Grafsch Bay had to engage the Exeter again, and after 40 minutes, water, believe it or not, splashed from an 11-inch near-miss, short-circuited the exposed electrical systems for the last remaining turret, and the Exeter was forced to break off. Whilst it would have been tempting at this point to try and finish off the annoying British heavy cruiser, the Ajax and Achilles were continuing to bombard the ship, and that drew the Graf Spee's attention as a potential threat. Ajax would close and try to fire torpedoes, but received an 11-inch hit to her X turret for troubles, which put it out of action, and also jammed Y turret, leaving her with only her forward guns remaining. Shortly after this, another 11-inch shell destroyed the Ajax's mast, and tactics were changed. The British deciding to try and attack at night, where visibility would be much reduced, and use torpedoes against the ship, which was quite clearly practically immune to the 6-inch fire of Ajax and Achilles. Therefore, the two combat-capable British cruisers began to fall back and shadow the ship, whilst Com Commodore Harwood was signalling the Cumberland to come for assistance, and the Admiralty was ordering every ship within 3,000 miles to proceed to the River Plate for the same purposes. As the sun set, just before 9 o'clock, the four ships had been fighting for pretty much the entire day, and the Grafsch Bay entered Montevideo, with a total of 108 men killed on both sides, 36 on Grafsch Bay and the remainder on the British and New Zealand ships. Once in port, it was discovered that most of the hits scored by the British cruisers had caused only minor damage, but the diesel purification plant being destroyed, along with the desalination plant and galley, were significant problems. A hole in the bow would also affect her seaworthiness should she encounter heavy seas. Finally, there was the issue that the ship had fired off of the vast majority of its ammunition. Repairs were estimated to take about two weeks. Unfortunately, the ship only had 72 hours before she would be interned for the duration of the war due to neutrality restrictions surrounding the neutral ports. Meanwhile, although the HMS Cumberland was nearby and ready to replace the Exeter, the Admiralty was broadcasting a series of signals on frequencies known to be intercepted by German intelligence. These and other operations at nearby ports implied that the carrier Ark Royal and battlecruiser Renown were about to arrive, when in fact they were almost two and a half thousand miles away. Believing the British reports, Langsdorf discussed his options with Berlin. These basically amounted to try and seek refuge in Buenos Aires, or scuttle the ship in the plate estuary. Since Captain Langsdorff was under no illusions as to whether or not he could successfully fight the HMS Renown, he decided to scuttle his ship. On the 18th of September, with only Langsdorff and 40 other men aboard, the ship began to move out of Montevideo, with a crowd of about 20,000 watching, expecting the ship to be moving out for battle against the reinforced British squadron, since the Cumberland by this point had managed to arrive. Instead, just after reaching the edge of territorial waters, massive explosions from scuttling charges and munitions set about the ship sent jets of flame high into the air and created a large cloud of smoke that obscured the ship which began to settle in the shallow water and would burn for the next two days. Whilst the ship's crew were then taken to Argentina, where they would be interned for the remainder of the war, tragically Captain Langsdorff decided to shoot himself whilst in full dress uniform and lying on the ship's battle ensign in his hotel room. 
The wreck would be partially broken up in 1942 to 1943, although parts of the ship are still visible, since the wreck is at a depth of only 11 metres. In 2004, other parts of the ship were raised as it was beginning to become a hazard to navigation. Some of these parts can be seen in Uruguay today. The vast majority of prisoners captured by the Grafsch Bay would be held on the supply ship Altmark, which would attempt to make its own way home to Germany, but would be captured off the Norwegian coast by HMS Cossack, freeing these prisoners to return to Britain. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below.